On today's episode, China lands on the moon, Starliner has even more problems, and the Dear Moon mission has been cancelled. Quick bit of housekeeping here, you don't recognize my voice necessarily, but you do recognize my words. I'm Ted, I've been the head writer on the Space Race channel ever since we started it, and I am just filling in for Sean, he's our main voice guy. He's getting married right now, and he's going on a little bit of a honeymoon, so he's going to be away for a couple weeks. I'm going to be reading the news, but Sean is going to come back, and we're going to uh, have a little segment after the first break where you're going to see us both on camera, and hopefully everything will be explained and uh, we'll all be good. So, uh... Got it? Good, let's get going. China has reported a successful touchdown on the far side of the moon with their Chang'e 6 sample return mission. The robotic landing system is currently gathering lunar rock and dirt from a combination scoop and drill system. After two days of sample collection, that material will be making its way back to the Earth, where it's expected to touch down on June 25th. And this will be the first time that samples from the far side of the moon have been available for study. Here's how the mission went so far. After blasting off on a Long March 5 rocket, the Chang'e 6 spacecraft inserted itself into a high orbit around the moon, traveling in an oval shape between 200,000 and 400,000 kilometers above the surface. The spacecraft consists of four key components. There's a service module, a lander, an ascent vehicle, and a re-entry capsule. The total mass being a little over eight metric tons. Over the next few weeks, the vehicle slowly brought itself down into a circular orbit, and during this time the probe was scoping out its ideal landing site, targeting an area inside the South Apollo Crater, which is a part of the South Pole Aiken Basin on the moon's far side. With the location set, the lander separated from the re-entry module and made its way down to the lunar surface. Again, this is a slow and steady process. The lander paused to make rapid positional adjustments at an altitude of 2.5 kilometers before continuing down to an altitude of 100 meters where it entered a hover phase. From this position, the probe used a combination of LiDAR and optical cameras to pinpoint a safe landing spot. So as far as we know, the landing was successful. This would be China's fourth lunar landing so far and their second time visiting the far side of the moon. It's also the third man-made object to reach the moon in this year. We already had the Japanese SLIM and the intuitive machines Odysseus. However, both of those landers found themselves the wrong way up. According to the information that we've got right now, the Chinese landed with the flamey end down. Now, what comes next? Over the course of two days, the lander will be collecting samples from two onboard devices. One is a scoop for surface samples of the lunar regolith, and the other is a coring drill that can penetrate up to six and a half feet or two meters under the ground. Around four and a half pounds or two kilograms of lunar rock and soil will be collected by the probe and then transferred to an ascent module, which is like a miniature rocket that will blast off from the lander platform and rendezvous with the orbiter. And that vehicle will then make a slow return to the Earth. And the re-entry capsule will parachute down to the surface on June 25th and touch down in the grasslands of Mongolia. But that's not all. Chang'e 6 also brought along a few bonus payloads. Some we know about, others are more mysterious. We know that Chang'e 6 deployed a small satellite called iCube-Q into lunar orbit. This CubeSat was developed by Pakistan in collaboration with the Chinese. It's already provided these photos from lunar orbit, and the goal of this device is to create a model of the moon's magnetic field. There are three more international devices that were brought down to the surface on the landing module. The negative ions at the lunar surface payload was developed by the Swedish Institute of Space Physics and the detection of outgassing radon instrument is from France that will collect data during the lunar lander's operation period on the surface. There's also an Italian instrument on there called the Passive Laser Retro Reflector. And then, there's a very mysterious and very tiny lunar rover. This was spotted on some recently released pre-flight images of the Chang'e 6 vehicle. Not entirely clear what the purpose of this little guy is. It's a little weird that no one really knows what it's there for. The major accomplishment here is that we are now very close to getting our hands on sample material from the far side of the moon, which is just the side of the moon that's always facing away from us whenever we try to look at it. What's interesting though is that there really shouldn't be any difference between the two sides of the moon, but there is. 
The far side is actually much more plain looking. It doesn't have all of the big dark spots and volcanic regions like the side that we look at. And even the very smart people who study this stuff can't really explain why that is. So hopefully something inside this sample collection will help with that. Hey, so we've been uploading videos on this channel for over three years now, and we've created over 250 videos in that time. And we think it's about time, actually probably past time, that you meet the team behind the space race. So today we're peeling back the curtain and letting you get to know us a little bit more, as well as sharing some exciting new things we've been working on with you later at the end of the video. If you haven't guessed by now, I am the voice of the channel. My name is Sean, and I also help with managing all of the behind the scenes. Hey, I'm Ted. You might recognize me as Sean's AI voice clone, but I'm also the head writer and editor of The Space Race. I'm the space nerd behind all of the content that you hear. Hey, I'm Jay. I'm the lead uh, editor for The Space Race. Hi, I'm Brady. I'm also an editor on The Space Race, and I also do motion graphics on the side. Hey, uh, I'm Chris. I've just kind of recently come on to do the uh, 3D work you might have seen. Hey, I'm Tanner. I'm an average Discord mod. <laughs> Together, we create each and every video you've seen on the channel, and we just want to thank you for watching and enjoying all of our content. It's really our goal to make the best videos we possibly can, and we want to continue to do that for you each and every week. For those of you who would like to support us more directly, we have just launched an official membership program here on YouTube as well as on Patreon. We've got tons of great perks from ad-free videos and exclusive content, all the way to participating in the creation of our videos as an official Space Race producer or becoming a guest writer on our blog. Click the join button on YouTube or check out our Patreon through the link in the description for more details. The Dear Moon mission is cancelled. This is a significant blow to a lot of different people, but particularly to the space YouTube community. Our boy, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, will not be flying to the moon after all. Sorry about that, bud. Dear Moon was an event conceived by the Japanese billionaire Yuzaku Maizawa, and the plan was to use the SpaceX Starship to fly himself and eight people on a voyage around the moon. Ostensibly, Maizawa's goal was a mission to bring a crew of artists and influencers to see the moon up close from orbit and then communicate that experience to the people of the Earth using their particular sets of skills and talents. It was a really beautiful idea. The big problem here seems to have been timelines. I don't think that's the entire story, but we should note that the Dear Moon mission was first announced back in 2018. So at this time, all that SpaceX had was a concept for their BFR rocket. Starship didn't even exist yet, and the assumption was made that the mission could launch by 2023. Then, in December 2022, Dear Moon announced their crew of eight people, which also included the music producer Steve Aoki. There were two photographers, a filmmaker, a singer, an actor, a YouTuber, and a multidisciplinary creative named Yemi AD. And at the point of this announcement, Starship had not lifted off even one time, so anyone who knew anything about spaceflight, such as the everyday astronaut himself, would know that a launch in 2023 was not going to happen, or 2024, or really any time in the short or even medium term. Uh, apparently Mr. Mizawa was not as well informed on the subject as you would think, and according to his own statements, he basically just got sick of waiting and called the whole thing off. He said, quote, I can't plan my future in this situation, and I feel terrible making the crew members wait longer, hence the difficult decision to cancel at this point in time. On the one hand, this is potentially a consequence of Elon Musk's ludicrous timeline estimates. If you tell someone that a thing is going to be ready at a certain time, and then in reality it's not even close to being ready and well past the original date, then people would get understandably upset about that. Though it's also possible that this change in plans might have something to do with Mr. Mizawa's plummeting wealth. When Dear Moon was announced, the billionaire paid an undisclosed amount of money to SpaceX as a deposit. It's an amount that SpaceX calls not insignificant, and they said that it was enough to help fund the BFR development, so probably a lot. And at the time, Mizawa was worth $3 billion. That fell to around $2 billion by the year 2020 and has continued to trend downwards to a net worth of $1.5 billion, which is still not broke, but, you know, in today's economy. Either way, it's very unfortunate news, uh, not just for the crew, but all of us stood to gain from the work that they could have done up there. Now, of course, we're still pretty far away from a finalized Starship design that is crew-rated for both launch 
and landing, that's several years down the road. So there is still plenty of time for a different wealthy person to come in and pick up the torch for Dear Moon. That's our hope, at least. The launch of Boeing's Starliner capsule was scrubbed on the launch pad yet again. The attempted launch of two crew members to the ISS on June 1st was called off at T plus 3 minutes and 50 seconds, except this time, it's probably not Boeing's fault, not directly at least. So the explanation for the scrub comes from the United Launch Alliance, or ULA, and suggests that this was an error on the launch vehicle and not the capsule itself. ULA says that a card known as the Launch Sequencer in one of three redundant ground control computers came up slower than the other two when exiting a pre-planned hold at T-4 minutes. NASA then reported that ULA had found a problem with a power supply unit used by a portion of the cards in the one computer. That includes the card that controls valves used for replenishing propellants on the Centaur upper stage of the rocket which also malfunctioned earlier in the countdown. About two hours before the scheduled liftoff, launch controllers reported a problem with the valves that control the flow of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen into the Centaur upper stage, which tops off its fuel tanks. So in theory, all that needs to be done is to replace the faulty computer rack and everything should be good to go for the next launch window. But at the time of writing, that is scheduled for June the 5th, which will likely also be your time of listening, so if for whatever reason the Starliner can't make the new date, then there will be even more problems. NASA and ULA have said that if Starliner does not launch by June 6, they will have to stand down in order to do work on the rocket itself, which is mostly replacing expired batteries. That work should take about 10 days to complete. <laughs> 